so we're going to start a new series here at the Foundry Church. It's called Short and Sweet. Don't judge a book by its number because we know this. A lot of times we will not know about these little books in the Bible that are there and we think, well, they're so small they don't really matter, but they actually matter a great deal. And these books have so much truth in them. So we're going to take some time and we are going to talk through and work through the small, short, and sweet books of the New Testament. We're going to spend some time up till the Advent season looking at these. And we'll be looking at them as they were written as pastoral letters. A lot of them were written from the early church fathers, and they wrote them to the churches that they planted or had been leading. And we are going to take a look and see what's going on in these books and the way they're challenging us. It's an exciting thing um, for us to dive into because they're so... What I love about these short books is they don't really mince words. They're like, hey, everybody, how's it going? Get your life straight. And you're like, oh, the Apostle John, that's so rough. But it's really, really good. It's really good. And we don't want you to judge a book by its number. We want you to engage with it and really understand what it means to to look at these books in context and in the reality of our context here and now. So as we look at this, what we're going to do is we're going to have some fun with it. Because uh, there's these short and sweet books from when we were little that we used to read. Anybody here used to read little golden books when you were a little kid? Yeah, and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember those. Like you, your mom or your dad would read those to you whenever I read them to the children. I, too, fell asleep. Um, I would just be like, you know, kind of drowning out. It was awesome. But we would read these stories, and they, there's great stories. So here's what we're going to do. We have paired each week's teaching up with a short and sweet story from like little golden books. This week is clearly Princess in the Pea. Can you see the little peas under there? Yeah, that's Eric is doing. That's not mine. I would have never thought of that. Um, but uh, there's these little pea pods under there. And tonight we're going to talk about the Princess in the Pea. Now, let me be very clear. When we talk about the Princess in the Pea today, that is not the gospel. They're not Bible, they're little golden books, but they're not the Bible. And we're using them, you've you've heard me tell stories about my brother Lincoln, about myself, my family, different things that have happened in the church. We're gonna use it kind of like that. We're gonna use it to tell our story and drive the narrative of where we're going. I believe these short, sweet books in the Bible are kind of like a Bruce Lee punch, right? Remember Bruce Lee? And he was like this kung fu master and he could be like that far away from you, be like, Kusa! and you'd like fly across the room. I feel like these books have that opportunity and I'm excited for you and I to kind of take maybe a little bit of a throat punch from the Apostle John and find ourselves getting up going, wow, that, that is real truth. So before we dive into the gospel or to the first um, letter of John, Let me tell you or talk with you about peas and imposters. Peas and imposters, why we chose the princess and the pea. Here's in case you forgot. Maybe you're a little older and you have some wisdom on the side of your head in the form of gray hair and you've forgotten. What's the story of the princess and the pea? There was once a prince and he was... He was a good-looking guy, right? He was one of those good-looking princes who had it all. And he went around the world looking for a princess. He wanted somebody to marry. And so he goes, he searches the world over, he can find no one. He comes back much dejected and sad of heart. And he just kind of sulks into the castle and lays down and goes to bed. And that night, a great storm kind of churned up off the North Atlantic it's a story written in the, in the Nordic area. It was by Hans Christian Andersen. And um, this huge storm blows in off the North Atlantic, and, and the wind is whipping, and the rain's kind of blowing sideways. And there's, you could faintly hear the rap of little knuckles on a door. And the king himself went out to the town gate, and he opened it, and he saw this girl, and she was just drenched head to toe. She looked like a drowned rat. She said, please, can you help me? I, I just need a place to stay. I'm a princess. And he's like, yeah, you don't look like a princess. My son has seen every princess and imposter of princesses the world over. You're an imposter. But still, come in. The queen, the prince's mom, has this idea. Wait a minute. What if we find out if she's an imposter or a princess? So she goes into the bedchamber, and she takes mattresses, a couple mattresses at first, puts a pea under it with a number of duvet bedding on top. 
And the princess goes to bed, wakes up the next morning, and she just looks miserable. And they're like, how'd you sleep? Oh, so terrible. There was something so hard in my bed, I'm just black and blue. And the queen's like, oh, she has a delicate tendency. Maybe she's not an imposter. Eventually, she has 20 mattresses and 20 feather duvets. And she comes to breakfast looking like five miles of dirt road. Just, oh, oh, you know. And they're like, how'd you sleep? Oh, so bad. There is something so hard under my bed. And it just, I am bruised head to toe. I can't take it. And the queen knew in that moment that because of her delicate nature, she was no imposter, but indeed she was a princess. And they gave this very sleepy, but eventually beautiful bride-to-be to their son. Because she wasn't an imposter, she was a princess. Today we're going to talk from the first letter written by the Apostle John to the churches. And we're going to look at one of the charges John gives us. Beware of imposters. It says this in 1 John. Children, uh, by the way, this, this uh, text comes out of um, the message version. It's a transliteration by um, uh, Eugene Peterson. It's an excellent uh, way to read the Bible, but it's not an exact translation, but it's, it's really well done in our language. And it says this. Children. Time is just about up. You heard that Antichrist is coming. Well, they are already all over the place. Antichrists everywhere you look. That's how we know that we're close to the end. They left us, but they were never really with us, he says. If they had been, they would have stuck it out with us, loyal to the end. In leaving, they showed their true colors and showed that they never did belong. But you belong. The Holy One anointed you, and you all know it. I haven't been writing this to tell you something you didn't know, but to confirm the truth that you do know and to remind you that the truth doesn't breed lies. So who is lying here? It is the person who denies that Jesus Christ is the divine Christ. That's who's lying. This is who makes an antichrist, the one denying the Father, denying the Son. No one who denies the Son has any part with the Father, but affirming the Son is an embrace of of our Heavenly Father as well. Stay with what you heard from the beginning, the original gospel message. Let it sink into your life. If what you heard from the beginning lives deeply in you, you will live deeply in both the Son and the Father. This is exactly what Christ promised. Eternal life, real life. I've written to warn you about those who are trying to deceive you, but they are no match for what is embedded deeply within you. Christ's anointing, nothing less than that. You don't need any of their so-called teaching. Christ's anointing teaches you the truth on everything you need to know about yourself and him, uncontaminated by a single lie. Live deeply in what you are taught. The Apostle John writes to the church, and he's saying this, test the teachers. If someone's teaching you, test the teachers. Tonight, we're really going to lean in, and this, is, this teaching is, is hopefully going to inspire in you and me the, the willingness to test the influencers. It's one of the cultural shifts that's happened in our last five years, I would say. We don't really have superstars anymore. Remember back in the day, we had big television stars and movie stars. They're still there, but maybe you've heard this term of late. We have influencers. Anybody heard that word? They're an influencer. It's, it's kind of the social media age, and they talk about influencers, people who influence others. And the Apostle John is telling us And telling his church, you may hear all these things, but test the people who influence you. Put them to the test. So we're going to walk through four primary tests today and find out, well, what's the message they're teaching and is it a gospel message? Because if they're influencing us, we need to see in which which direction we're hearing from. In uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says this, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands, and we have touched them. This we proclaim, the word of life. What John's doing is he's telling us test number one should be, do we know who Jesus is? Do we know who Jesus is? Because John says we've looked at him, we've heard him teach, we've written it down. He appeared to us. In the Gospel of John, we hear him say it this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and everything that has been made was made through him, and nothing that was made was made apart from him. 
And what he's saying is, I know who Jesus is. So let me just ask you, church, is it important for us to know who Jesus is? I would say yes and amen. We have to know who it is that we proclaim, who it is that we put our faith in. So this is who John is telling us who Jesus is. He is the Son of God, co-eternal, part of the Trinity. We are a triune faith, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. We know who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He is co-eternal. He has always been. There's no time and space without Jesus. He's always been present with the Father. And we know this to be true. John's confession tells us from the beginning, we know that Jesus was there. He was the very first word of creation. But we also know this, that Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. This is like something, how because I'm bad at math, it makes sense to me, but 100% God and 100% man did not mean 200% of anything. It meant 100% Jesus. It's, it's a painfully delicate balance. It's called in theology the hypostatic union, this, this tension that we hold that Jesus Christ was fully God, and he reduced himself into full humanity. He understood everything we go through. Have you ever thought about it? Jesus knows what it was like to have a crush on a cute girl at school and have her reject him. He walked home sometimes crying because kids teased him. Jesus kicked his toe and hopped around going, oh, oh, like you and I. We don't like to think these non-noble thoughts, these common thoughts of Jesus, but he was fully human. He was a carpenter. His thumb was probably painted black. With his own blood, when he went, whop, right? You're like, well, how could he do that? He was fully human, fully human. He had the full expanse of the human experience, but he was also fully God. And his humanity veiled some of the godness in him, but it didn't remove it. He was fully God, and he was fully man, and John declares that to us. Anyone who denies that Jesus Christ is the co-eternal Son of God, Savior of you and I by his blood in his life, death, and resurrection, is a liar. They are a false teacher. Run. Run. Anyone who denies the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who he was and who he is. Anyone who ever says to you, I, you know, I'm not a Christian. I believe Jesus was a good guy, but it's not my thing. Let's just unpack that real quick. He said he was God and the Savior of the world. And billions of people, 2.8 billion on the planet currently cling to him as Lord and Savior. So if he wasn't, he is no good moral teacher. He is the deceiver of the world. He is one or the other. We must choose. Don't ever let somebody slide by being like, he's a good man. No, he's not. He's either God, the incarnate son of God who died for our sins, or he's a liar. He can't be both. Anyone who doesn't hold up the answer to the hold up to the test of the answer to this question, who is Jesus? You got to test him. You got to test me. If I ne- if you ever feel convicted, test me and come up and say, Eric, I don't feel like you claim that. You have to test those who influence. Test number two. What's the deal with sin? Right? I, I don't think the world takes sin very seriously. And we need to ask, what's the deal with sin? And how did the Apostle John seek to find imposters? How did he look for imposters who were influencers and, and try to kind of, you know, out them? It says this in 1 John, uh, 1 John 1, 6 to 8. If we claim to have fellowship with him, Jesus, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So if you claim to love Jesus but you live in sin, you're a liar. You're a liar. There is no partnership in that. But sin, sin we need to deal with. Because God deals with sin very different than you and I, right? We'll be like, oh, it was just a little white lie. It wasn't that big of a deal. It was just a little, you know, sleight of hand. Here's the thing. God deals with sin brutally. If you want to see how much God 
well, how much weight sin carries, look at the cross. That's what it took to deal with sin. The blood of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection is the only means of atoning for our sin. So when we look at Jesus Christ, we can see that the deal with sin is it was the one thing that broke relationship with God between us and God. Sin is the issue. Sin is the issue. And 1 John 6 through 8 would say this, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from sin. It's a critical aspect. We need to understand that sin is the issue. If you have a place where you worship and people are like, oh, it's okay, come as you are and never change, never be remade into the image of Christ, run away from them, they're liars. They're liars, there's no truth in them. If It says this in 1 John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It actually goes on to say, if we claim we haven't sinned, we make Jesus out to be a liar and his word is not in us. We better deal with sin right up front and recognize we have to confess it, repent and turn away from it and run towards Jesus Christ. Sin is the issue. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all kind of like if you're in the church, you're like, yeah, it's like a memory verse, right? We feel good about it. But all have sinned. All have suffered a broken relationship with God because of sin. Sin still matters. Anyone who teaches that sin doesn't matter is a liar, run Run, run, run. If someone makes you feel comfortable in your sin, pastor, priest, or anyone, run from them. They're sending you to hell well comforted. Your sin matters to God. Sin's effect is never changing. It breaks the relationship between us and God. Willful, unrepentant sin breaks relationship. And so we have to recognize how do we, how do we fight this? How do we test our teachers? Maybe uh, Matt Kuman said it last week when we were talking about this teaching, and I thought it was really good. Don't ask if it's a sin. Like when, when you're looking at a teacher, don't ask if obeying or listening to what they said and doing it is a sin. Ask this instead. Would that break relationship with God if I followed through on that teaching? Isn't that a good question? I mean, for being 25, I was like, what up, deep waters, Matt? You know, I thought that was pretty good. Don't ask if it's a sin. Ask, will it break relationship? Because that's what sin does. Sin has always broken relationship. Test number three, forgiveness. When we, when we confess our sins, when we lay out to Christ that, yes, we confess that we're sinners, we're broken and we're in need of grace, <sighs> We don't want to be imposters, right? We don't want to pretend we have it together. So when we lay out that we are sinners, we actually are given a promise in 1 John 1.9. It says, if we confess, excuse me, if we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and forgive us from all wrongdoing. How good is that? If we confess it. If we recognize and hold on to it, we receive forgiveness. But make sure anybody you listen to, anybody who influences you, if they tell you, you don't have to confess that, that's the way you were made. It's okay. Anyone who tells you you don't need forgiveness from God is lying. Run. Run. Forgiveness is an essential part of the equation. It's an essential part of the equation 1 John 2, 1 to 2 says this, My children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. If anybody does sin, isn't that a good qualifier? Because like when you read that, it's like, I write this to you so you won't sin. And all of us just went, oh, super lame. I already did that right before I came in church. And then I stole the last salami when I knew a hungry lady was behind me at the table. Right? Nobody else feels bad about that. You're like, no, I'm good. I needed that salami. Right, but you realize you're like, oh man, I've already sinned. It's already too late. But he goes on to say, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father and his name is Jesus Christ. We have an advocate. We have an attorney. And that attorney has the deal in his hand. And it's his blood. And when we stand in our sin, 
and we are convicted before Almighty God, Jesus steps in and says, wait a minute, wait, no, that one's mine. That one stands under my blood. They stand forgiven. Anyone, anyone who doesn't teach that we have to turn to Jesus for forgiveness is a liar. They're a liar and we have to be careful and run from them. Run like they're chasing you. Our sins are forgiven completely and only in Christ. When you confess your sins, you are justified. You're justified. You are made pure. It's the legal deal done. Jesus says, no, don't judge them on their sin. I took their sin on the cross. And God's wrath is abated immediately. Like, amen to that, right? Aren't you glad that news is out there? But there's another step that we are being transformed. We are becoming like Christ. The Spirit of God fills us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God fills us. I'm dyslexic, so I fill from the bottom up. But I guess it'd be more if it poured in, right? It's weird, I never realized that. But you know, like God pours himself into us and by his Spirit's presence from glory to glory, he is transforming us out of this sinful state into the very image and reflection of Jesus Christ. But if there's not forgiveness first, then it's a lie. Anyone who tells you that you can purify yourself or you can reach a spiritual plane without seeking and receiving the forgiveness through Jesus Christ is a liar. Run from them. Run from them. There are people in John's day, they're called Gnostics. I like to call them Gnostics, but the G is silent. Um, But they're Gnostics. You know what the Gnostics do? They're kind of weird. They go out on their own and they receive special revelation. And they have this idea in them that the spirit is perfectly pure and good, and the body is the sinful thing, so they separate it, and they actually, the Gnostics worked hard to say Jesus, well, the God part was spirit, and the human part was all sin. That's not how it worked. Jesus was sinless, physically and spiritually. He was sinless until the wrath of God was poured out on him on the cross. Then he took the sin of us all. He took the sin of us all, but he was not two separate independent beings like the feelers of a, um, like a weird, like, you know, lobster, like two independent. No, that's not how it works. Gnostics are wrong. We're not spirit and body, totally dependent, one good, one bad. We are sinful by nature. Sin's not what you do. It's who you are, unless you are in Christ. And for all who are in Christ, as Paul wrote, you're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen to that. Isn't that good news? When you realize that our sin can be fully dealt with, anyone who teaches you that sins can be forgiven or paid for in any other way than Jesus Christ is a liar. Don't balk at telling them so and run. Run from that teaching. Don't listen to them. There is no my truth, right? Well, Jesus may be your truth, but my truth is really that I feel God in nature. Oh my gosh, that's awesome, but you're going to hell. Let's work on that. Let's talk about truth. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. What John is telling us is one of the great ways to test whether or not a teacher or an influencer is godly is to see, do they bring you to Jesus? John always points His church is back to Jesus. Run to him who paid for your sins. Run to him who paid for my sins. Run to him. Go to Jesus. you got to challenge the church. Hear me on this. You, you have to challenge the church. There's pastors out there who are beginning to let things sink into the church because it's culturally okay, but it's biblically sin, and it's killing us. Challenge it. Stand up and ask the tough questions. Challenge me. I mean, I lose arguments all the time. I'm actually quite skilled at it. I would love if you, you know, were a priest and prophet to one another, the great Reformed tradition, the priesthood of all believers, I would love if you would challenge me on this because the early church did it in around the 1500s when suddenly the sale of indulgences within the the Catholic Church was too much to bear, and they realized people were buying their loved ones out of hell, but they weren't buying them out of hell. They were just making priests rich. And someone stood up and said, that's not true. That's not how you get forgiveness. 
Don't think we can't change the world by receiving and proclaiming forgiveness only in Jesus Christ. And finally, the test of love. Test number four is love. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. That's what John said to the early church. Anyone who hates a brother or sister, they're still in the darkness. That's how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Anyone who hates and doesn't love their brother and sister is apart from Christ. When we look at this and we understand that the apostle John was talking to the church and he was saying to them, you, he's saying to them, you can't hate each other. I know they're doorknobs, but you can still love them. Like there's tons of people I don't like. Anybody else want to say amen? Just get amen, preach all day. There's so many weird people and I do not like them. And why are they around me, right? You don't have to like them, but you have to love them. You have to love them. You cannot hate people who were made in the image of God and be the church. That's just not how it works. There is a love test. Anyone who hates your brother or sister, you're not a believer. I'm not saying you have to get along, sing kumbaya, but you do have to love them. And to love them, you have critical conversations. You confront things. They confront things in you and it's hard. Iron sharpening iron is a very hot, rugged process. It's a lot of sparks flying because it's painful. But that's how we're sharpened. But don't love in only words. Love in action. Let your love be seen in the life you live around the church, with the church. And know this, that you can't love the world. You can't love the world and trust me, it is full of every good delicacy we could ever want. And it will leave us feeling empty and hollow. We have to understand that it's so easy to hate our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. For some reason, it's just easier that way. And it's so easy to love the world. And one is meant for our benefit, blessing, and fullest life in Christ. And the other is meant for our destruction. When we love the world, we are on a path to destruction. So let me say it this way, hate for fellow believers, disunity, slander, or anything like it, or love for the world, which is the lust of your eyes. Your God is your stomach and your pride, right? How you look and how you appear. Anyone who has that hatred for believers and love for the world, well, you're not in Christ. Anyone who is influencing us to hate one another and love that world, Accept them as they are. Why? We can't. Because God, though he accepts us as we are, he calls us into Him, his image. He remakes us. So the question really comes out for us in this. Will we be real and love people at great cost or will we be fake? Remember the, the princess in the pea? The great work that was done to find out if this little princess was an imposter or the real thing. It was hard on her. She was black and blue and very tender of constitution, right? I mean, it was a pea under 20 mattresses. I can sleep on a wood floor if you give me three seconds, right? But she was just like, oh, I just couldn't do it. They found out, they tested and found out she was not an imposter. She was the real thing. Don't be afraid to test the influencers in your life, what you're listening to on podcasts what you're listening to in music, the influencers you turn yourself to, towards, anything that teaches against the truths of love, of forgiveness, of who is Jesus, anything that goes against those things, anything that tells you you don't gotta worry about sin, test it and see if it holds up to the gospel claim. Set up some mattresses. I'm gonna say it. You should probably take a P test. I know, I, I'm an emotional eight-year-old, but I love it. It's perfect, right? Anybody who's got a job had to take one, right? This is just a different way. You got to do the test and test the influencers and see if they hold up to the truths of God's word, of who he said he is. Because I'll tell you this, being authentic, being real is not the standard we bear in the church. We are not called to be our most authentic self. We are called to be remade into the image of the one 
who died for our sins. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, may it be said of us that we were put to the test. And yes, physically we'll be black and blue from this world. But we will be really, truly people who can test the influencers. And we won't let bad teaching, bad influence into our life. But we will hold close to the gospel. And we will love Jesus. And we will love his church. And we will love the world beyond. Not because it was ever in our nature, but our nature has been remade by the one who died to save us. Amen? Lord Jesus Christ, we, your church, gather at the foot of the cross to remember the truth of the gospel, that by your life, by your death, by your resurrection, you secured for us an eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation so that all who would come are welcome and all, all are welcome to come as they are and be remade. God, humble us so that we can be remade. But God, also strengthen us because the task ahead of us is hard. It is hard to challenge the influencers in our lives, to test the teachers, the ones who try to speak truth into our lives. Lord, give us the courage to stand up and test the influences in this world so that they don't run unchecked away from the cross but that all the influences in our lives would point us back to the one true hope, the one who is the author and perfecter of our faith, our only hope. It is you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the influences we have lead us back to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.